This is Mike Billington uh, with the EIR, Executive Intelligence Review and the Schiller Institute. I'm uh, here with Graham Fuller. Uh, and if you can, perhaps you can give a bit of your various hats in your career. Well, um, in terms of public service, um, I was 25 years an operations officer in CIA. Um, is serving in Germany, Turkey, uh, uh, Lebanon, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, and Hong Kong. So a good bit of international background. Uh, I graduated um, from Harvard with a BA in, in Russian and language and literature and history, uh, MA in, in, in Middle East studies, and had a long interest at the same time in, in China. Um, after that, I, uh, after leaving, uh, retiring from uh, CIA, I, well, I was, I was four years as the um, vice chairman of the National Intelligence Council, which is the long range forecasting institution within CIA, and then uh, went to Rand Corporation to do more uh, geopolitical writings and things. And since then, I've been kind of freelancing written two novels, both somewhat political, and a lot of different books about the Middle East, uh, Islam, political Islam, et cetera. Okay, thanks. So uh, we sort of came about uh, having this interview because you watched the interview I did with Ambassador Chaz Freeman a couple of weeks ago. Um, he warned that the US has already crossed the red line in China by essentially promoting Taiwan independence and breaking all of the US-China agreements in the 70s that led to the one China policy and the recognition of uh, Beijing. So how, how do you appraise the danger of a uh, potential war between US and China, even a, even a potential nuclear war? Yeah, of course, I mean, it, is, it is serious. I, I, I'm not sure that the US, and I'm a huge admirer of Chaz Freeman, but I'm not sure the US has actually crossed a red line, but I think we are in the vicinity of doing that. Uh, and meanwhile, I think the United States is learning a lot about what it means to have a true peer competitor like China, as opposed to say the Soviet Union, which was militarily formidable, but in terms of societal and soft power, not at all. So uh, I, I'm not sure, I, I think the US has actually avoided specifically saying they will support uh, Taiwanese independence, but certainly we want to, uh, American policy wants to make it as difficult as possible for China to entertain any military views of uh, reconquering, re, re, re uh, joining Taiwan to, uh, to China. It's going to be a tight game, and I wish. I think the main the main goal really should be of both sides to let this tamp down the the pressure, the 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 uh, the level of rhetoric that is underway now, which makes it very hard for more rational and thoughtful discourse. The um, uh, on on the the same issue, really, on the Russian side. Um, President Putin has uh, also indicated that if the accepting of Ukraine into NATO or moving advanced weapon systems in, in Ukraine or on Russia's border would be a red line. And Biden asked about that, said, we don't recognize any red lines. Uh, on the summit uh, Tuesday, the uh, Blinken and Sullivan both came out immediately and gave readouts, which would make it appear that it was um, that the whole thing was Biden dressing down uh, Putin for its aggression and its threats and so forth. But then Biden himself said that um, that he would be announcing tomorrow, Friday, uh, a meeting with four European countries and Russia to address Putin's request for guarantees that NATO would not move any further east or deploy weapon systems on their border. What is, uh, in general, what do you think about the summit and the potential for avoiding the, the conflict on the Russian side? Well, this is, of course, a long-standing issue. Um, 
I think the United, in very broad terms, and this applies to China policy as well as to Russia policy, the United States has been so long in the habit of dominating, not, all, not always in a negative sense, but dominating the world since 1945, uh, where other countries would defer to the United States. We, uh, the United States had the, 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 the money, uh, the weaponry, um, the technology and everything else to, to be the number one player really in the world through that time. So it's, I think this has been a gradual policy of the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world, slowly trying to uh, catch up. Certainly Europe has, but much of the rest of the world as well. But in the meantime, during the whole Cold War period, the United States was in the position of, um, the, the rhetoric was defender of the free world, quote unquote. Um, so I think the United States has, has felt itself uh, really the dominant power, the hegemon of the world, uh, the leader of the free world, whatever terms you choose to use. But the reality uh, in the modern world, and especially since 9-11, has been that the, um, the American hegemony predominance is a fading quality and that much of the rest of the world is now rising. This I think American mentality, uh, strategic mentality, maybe even cultural mentality, finds it nearly impossible, intolerable to accept the idea that any other country could become a peer competitor with the United States. I remember a couple of years ago, the uh, attending some military conferences or wherever in, in Washington, that the, the term used by the Pentagon in those days was America's search or maintenance of all, um, all horizon dominance. That's not quite the word, it wasn't horizon, but uh, something like that, all azimuth uh, dominance. Also, no, I'm sorry, all spectrum dominance. Full, full spectrum dominance, oh, not yeah, full you spectrum dominance. That says a lot right there. Um, and I think it, the, the, it, it, this is a slow, very, very painful, hopefully learning process by which the US is going to have to back away ever more carefully from overt assumption that it's going to be able to call all the shots anymore. I mean, I think we even saw this with, with the very un, unfortunate Blinken conference and maybe Sullivan as well in the Anchorage meeting when right. Sullivan or Blinken prior to the meeting announced that he was very confident the meeting would go well and the United States would be dealing with China from a position of strength. Well, you may recall he was he was dressed down for that quite sharply by the Chinese who basically said, how dare you say that? Uh, you have no right to say that you are dealing with this from a position of strength. We are going to deal, we, we are, want to be treated, we will be treated as equals by you on an equal footing. I think that, that pushed back, I, maybe shocked even, the, the foreign policy blob in Washington, which has never quite been addressed in those terms by a country that is pretty demonstrably becoming a peer competitor in almost all respects. Mm. It reminds me of the clean break doctrine in the 90s. Uh, this was Wormser and, and, and Fife and, uh, and Cheney and Rumsfeld. They, they basically said, we need a clean break to defend our friends in Israel. And then literally uh, said, I think this was called the Wolfowitz doctrine, that we must prevent any country or any combination of countries to reach a position of challenging. Our, our dominance, our superiority. I mean, that was oh, and literally and even, the thinking. And even challenging Israeli dominance, I think was a good bit part of that. But yes, I mean, times are changing, the world is changing and it's gonna be a painful lesson, but I think maybe even Biden in his uh, late years may be beginning to realize that you the old rhetoric just doesn't work quite as well anymore and Russia is not quite the old Soviet Union, and Russia now working with China is certainly represents a very different global force, uh, not just militarily, but uh, I think, you know, strategically, culturally, uh, diplomatically, 
uh, in all in all senses. You know, it's interesting. One of the uh, several of the Russians uh, readouts on on the summit included saying what you just said that that um, uh, one of them called Biden an old fashioned uh, politician uh, who understands the danger of war and that one of them called on Biden to calm down the people around him. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Yeah, right. Okay, so um, so you were the station chief, uh, CIA station chief in Kabul in the 1970s. And I, I know you've remained very active in Afghan policy debates uh, uh, in more right up till today. Uh, clearly, that country is now in an economic and humanitarian uh, catastrophe. Both the World Food Program and the World Health Organization are screaming as loudly as they can that millions, many millions of Afghan citizens face death by starvation and lack of medical care uh, in, you know, as the winter sets in. And yet the U.S. is maintaining sanctions and freezing billions of dollars that belong to the Afghan people. Um, how do you explain this, what I consider depraved indifference and, uh, and what, how can we resolve that in your view? Well, as you know, uh, Mike, the, the Afghan people have been victim of great power rivalry for many, many decades, going back to uh, the uh, initial Soviet invasion of Afghanistan to protect the new communist regime that came into power there in 1978. So um, Americans and many Muslim states and others have been participating in, in war within Afghanistan that has killed hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Afghans over the many years, leading to um, civil war after, after the Soviet departure, the civil war among the, the um, Mujahideen, and then utter, utter uh, anarchy within Afghanistan for a number of years. And then the Taliban came in to restore order, a, a rough sort of frontier justice, peace order within the country, and then the whole bin Laden business, and then the American invasion. So this has been nonstop brutal thing. I What I fear is how Grace, gracefully, the United States is capable of accepting the fact that it, this is yet one more war, which we did not win, and that it is not going to have blood in its eye for the victors of the country, uh, the, the Taliban. I'm no great admirer of the Taliban, but they are the de facto winners, and I think nearly everybody in the region acknowledges it, for better or for worse. It is the reality. So I think if this is some kind of uh, vengeful policy towards the Taliban uh, to make them suffer, and maybe, who knows, maybe even there are those who, who want to hope that civil war might break out or whatever and give the U.S. a, a chance to renew foothold, I, I don't know, but it is, it is a very ugly policy if it goes beyond mere tactical temporary pressure points to try to get the Taliban to make a few political domestic uh, changes in outlook, if it goes much beyond that into a, into a broader vengeance or a desire to restore the status quo, uh, it will be tragic. And, and so part of such a long tragedy. Uh, hell does that... I, yeah, I go have ahead. to add, Mike, that, I mean, we see this elsewhere as well. I think in, in, in the case of Syria, um, the United States has been unhappy with Syria as far back as I can remember when I first went into government um, in the in the um, in the seventies, sixties even uh, that the Assad regime, father and son, uh, have long been hostile to American what they perceive as American hegemony in the Middle East and. Uh, Israel's ability to absolutely dominate militarily the entire region uh, without giving any particular justice to the Palestinians. So I think the United States has had it in for Syria for 40, 50, 60 years of trying to overthrow, not with major force, but with constant 
undermining of Syria in one way or another. Again, I'm no great admirer of the Syrian regime. It's never been a democracy. It's a minority government, but um, it's been the react. It's been the reality of the Middle East for a very long time. But even down to today, we can see U.S. involvement in civil wars in in Syria, in which much of the goal still is to punish Syria, bring down the regime, change it all, and it again has failed. And again, the victims, sadly, are the uh, are the Syrian um, people. But we just cannot seem to accept the reality that we have been bested again in that kind of a struggle. You wrote, um, you, you uh, argued at one point that, um, that there will be no resolution to the Middle East crisis unless uh, the Hezbollah and Hamas and, and Iran um, uh, are, are recognized, that, that they have to be a part of this. And yet uh, the, the Israelis and many, many uh, people here in the US consider all three of those institutions terrorists and you know, evil people and so forth. Uh, how is that going to be achieved? And I mean, what can be done with, especially with the Hezbollah and Hamas issues uh, and, and in Syria, how can you resolve that today? Well, as you know, the United States in particular has been ready to slap the label of terrorist on any uh, Muslim group that it does not like. Uh, I find it frankly almost grotesque that we have now come to persuade our uh, American countrymen that that Iran is the number one terrorist threat in the world. I mean, this is alongside Saudi Arabia, which has been pumping out uh, extraordinarily um, damaging interpretations of Islam, which, which, uh, which, which really leaves little room for, for generous accommodation, even among Muslims. So I, I, I think the term terrorist, you know, you're familiar in many countries that are uh, slapped this label on, on in groups that are seeking better rights or even seeking separation. Uh, and that applies um, as well to, to, to today. Hezbollah is, is the spokesman basically for most Shiites in Lebanon. The Shiites are the biggest single group in a very multicultural, multi-religious uh, country. They have formidable spirit and drive. Uh, many Lebanese who don't like them believe that Hezbollah is the one thing that maybe keeps Israel at bay from, from interfering or invading uh, Lebanon at will. It, indeed, Israel is, is very nervous about Hezbollah's uh, strength and it's not just purely military. It's it's this kind of uh, a drive, a will to 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 not to permit Israel to invade uh, the country. So and similarly with Hamas. I mean, Hamas is the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood has not been a terrorist organization fundamentally in 50 years. Um, it is a relatively middle of the road uh, Islamist organization. I'm not, I'm not arguing for Islamic movement, Islamist movements, but they are a major force within the Middle East, and there's a huge spectrum of them, uh, from you know radical terrorists, genuine terrorists like Bin Laden or the other other groups in in that region, uh, to uh, rather uh, very moderate uh, Islamic oriented groups uh, such as in in Turkey. So you can't s smear them all with one label. Um, the, the Muslim Brotherhood is very, continues to be concerned with Palestinian rights. Uh, there are, it's an Arab organization largely. So I think if we don't acknowledge full Palestinian rights um, and, the, and, and, and begin to solve that problem, this is going to continue to be a festering issue 
that plays right into the hands of more radical organizations, whether we like them or not, they're there, and there is a uh, there is a a call, a an issue that that uh, to which they they they, they can pl play. Let me just mention one other term I've always been always very important to me over the years, from the Egyptian ruler Abdul Nasser, if anybody still remembers him, back in the fifties, sixties. He was the charismatic leader who sort of put Egypt on the third world map for the first time. Anyway, somebody asked, asked Abdel Nas, and, and he became the, 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 the darling really of much of the Arab world because he stood up for Arab rights and spoke about them. Somebody asked him once, why, why do you think Egypt uh, has, such a, has such a major role uh, in, in the Arab world at, at that point? And he said, you know, the, he said the Egypt, the Arab world is in search of an actor and Egypt is now that actor. I think that applies to many situations around the world where there's a, there's a, a, a strong need for some political voice to speak up on behalf of one or another injustice of the world. And whatever country sees it, take, takes up that challenge uh, automatically is um, moves into a position of greater uh, respect and uh, even support by much, much of the world. And sadly, all these three organizations, the Muslim Brotherhood and Hezbollah, and um, what was the third? Well, Iran itself. Yeah, Iran, yeah, yeah. Iran. Um, are formidable political ideological forces in the region. Uh, Iran is probably the oldest civilization in the entire Middle East. It has managed to survive decades and decades of American sanctions and Israeli punishment and assassinations by Israelis, et cetera. They're still holding their own. It's a strong country, whether, again, we may not like it all, but I think we have contributed to pushing Iran into a corner in which it is reacting perhaps in a much more uh, aggressive, uh, reactive manner than might otherwise be the case. And we might talk about this before the interview is over, but just let me say here, we are not thinking enough in this world about why conflicts are coming about, are they inevitable, and can they be avoided? Sadly, I think in American thinking or much of the thinking of the world, these conflict wars are inevitable, but they're not. They just aren't. And it's, the, the trick is deciding how and why to avoid them because it is more, it is doable. Well, that obviously brings up the issue of the uh, military industrial complex that President Eisenhower warned about a long, long time ago that they need uh, wars. To be going on, they're 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 required by the the, uh, the the military industrial crowd and their Wall Street backers, uh, thinking that this cannot be allowed to diminish, or you know, they're going to lose their power. I don't know what you think about that. Well, I i'm it's very impressive when you look back at what eisenhower said way back in the day uh and look at today's reality i think he was spot on and in his observation i i would in, i try to avoid an entirely conspiratorial view that it's all wall street and and military industrial complex because there are many huge capitalist organizations corporations uh, that do not profit from war and seek to avoid war because it's not good for business. Mm -hmm. Many business, many businessmen and capitalists feel the war. Uh, other, if, if you're not producing arms, it may not be necessarily good for war at all. But that said, yes, uh, there is a war lobby, and it is linked with the American idea, with the idea that we must preserve American power. And, and hegemony and dominance at all costs. And that plays, of course, into the hands of those who want to support 
America's overwhelming military dominance in the world today. And yet we lose every war we fight. Well, somebody once commented to me, a, 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 a um, correspondent uh, who worked at the Pentagon, he said, you know, Graham, you, you, don't, get, you don't get it. Or, or some, somebody in the Pentagon said to him, you don't get it. It's not about winning wars. It's about maintaining the organization, maintaining the infrastructure. As long as the funds keep coming in, as long as we can maintain the, 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 the structure and the training and the weaponry and all of this, you don't have to win the wars. That's, that's secondary. It's nice to win, but it's secondary. What, what kind of an image of man is that? which thinks that <laughs> secondary issues, which murder millions of people and drive millions out of their homes are secondary issues. That's I like, agree. Yeah. I, I agree it's shocking, but I fear it's the human condition. Well, let, let, let's hope that's not the case. I, I've, actually, I'll, I'll bring up this issue of, of Ibn Sina that I mentioned to you before the interview. Uh, Helga's idea, El Gazette LaRouche's idea of this project Ibn Sina for Afghanistan uh, is based on that tradition of a great Arab leader uh, uh, who uh, represented the kind of leader you talked about with Nasser, but at an even higher level, a great philosopher, a great poet, and of course, also a medical genius. So I wondered if you might want to comment, you know, the history of Islam quite well. If you want to comment on, on the role of Ibn Sina and uh, Helga's idea of so-called Project Ibn Sina as a way of bringing the world together around the reconstruction of uh, Afghanistan, but also applying that to these issues of festering wars in the Middle East. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, Mike. Um, absolutely. Um, I think uh, by now most Westerners are aware that there was a golden age of Islam. Uh, there was a time uh, be, when intellectual life in the Muslim world, Arab world, Persian world, uh, and beyond in, in, in India and even, even further east, um, intellectual life was very rich. Uh, there were open, very interesting open theological discussions about, uh, about, about religion, about science, philosophy. There was no shutting down of the mind at that point. Many, many Muslims have since written after that, about, since then, about has there been a closing down of the Muslim mind? I think probably you can, you can demonstrate that there has been. The more important question is why. Um, one simple answer, it's not the only answer, but it's an important answer, is of course the long centuries of uh, Western um, imperialism, British, French, uh, German, Italian, uh, Dutch, uh, and American in, other, in another sense, that really helped keep these countries infantilized is the word I, I, I would use most readily, uh, that they came to rely on outside, they, they came to fatalistically yield to, the, to the, uh, the, the power of outside forces that would prevent them from taking charge of their own lives, thinking about these issues more deeply. So I think many people trace some of the decline of Arab and Persian and Muslim in general, Muslim intellectual and intellectualism, its sciences, its, its arts, and this gradual suppression uh, of, of intellectual tradition within the Muslim world, largely by the ulama, the clerical class that found itself entrenched in positions of power, as long as they supported the regime in power, uh, they could have their voice over over religious policy, absolutely. That contributed to it. Certainly even the, the shift of the great trade routes from overland across the, the um, Silk Route and into new sea routes around the Indian Ocean to East Asia. That also was a factor in the decline of the Muslim world, but it's undeniable uh, that this has taken place. 
I think in this sense, Ibn Sina is a reflection of, of an as, of, of, it's an aspiration to go back to what made the Muslim world so rich, so strong, so, so thoughtful, so productive intellectually in its time. I think it can happen again. There's no reason why it should not. But the Middle East has been caught in this terrible mess now for, you can, you can go back many, many, many decades, if not a hundred years of colonialism and uh, foreign control and dominance by, by dictators supported readily by the West, et cetera. It's a long, sad story, but Ibn Sina is one great symbol. He's not the only one, but there are many great symbols of a broader vision uh, of Islam, a more open uh, thinking, uh, exploratory Islam. Hmm. Good. Um, you're, you have something of a specialty on Turkey within the Islamic world. and. Uh, you wrote a book which was called Turkey and the Arab Spring. Uh, I take it this is your reflection on the Muslim Brotherhood, which was sort of the dominant force in the Arab Spring. And as I understand it, is, uh, uh, Erdogan is part of, of that. Do you, you want to uh, comment on that now in retrospect with the failure of the Arab failure or the downfall of the Arab Spring? Yeah, well, this brings up the very important question that I alluded to briefly earlier about uh, Islamism, Islamic movements, Islamist, whatever, there are many different terms. Uh, but basically the idea of Islamists is to put it in very simple terms, um, this is, it's, it's a spectrum of views, as I said, from bin Laden to peaceful, peaceful act, peace activists from an Islamic perspective. But um, it essentially is Muslim saying, look, Islam has something to say about the future of governance and, and society in the Muslim world. Uh, what it has to say, how, what we choose out of it, just as many, some of the early uh, European movements, Christian Democrats, et cetera, felt that Christianity had something to say intellectually or religiously or theologically to say about good governance in, in, in Europe. So I think the Muslim movements, some are horrible, brutal, uh, violent as such bin Laden and, and is be, the, the major case in point. The Taliban have been quite brutal in their, in their own way. Saudi Arabia has been a very brutal state supporting many brutal movements and ideas outside the country, indeed fomenting these ideas of intolerance so that there's only, it's not only Islam, but there's only one form of Islam and that's the Saudi form of Islam, which is Wahhabi, which is utterly uncompromising and very retrogressive. So anyway, the Muslim Brotherhood in all the spectrum is rather centrist. It has accepted the idea of democracy. It has political parties all around. These are not secret organizations and terrorist organizations. It hasn't been that for, for half, a day, half a century, but it, 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 it has accepted the idea of elections at the student level, the national level, participating in elections, accepting the idea of some kind of democratic practice. These ideas are utterly anathema to countries like Saudi Arabia or other Arab dictators or Muslim dictators anywhere who see this as subversive. So they have moved all out. That's why Saudi Arabia has been you know, quick to condemn the Muslim Brotherhood as terrorists, even though it's very, very difficult to make that case over the last 50 years. 50 years ago, yes, they dallied in it, but not since. So I think we, and Turkey uh, doesn't officially call itself Muslim Brotherhood, but certainly uh, the, the ruling party has good ties with it. And again, Turkey, it's, it's become an abusive democracy, but it's still a democracy. I mean, there are real elections. It's, it's an unfair or illiberal democracy is the term I think we use. But nonetheless, it still, uh, it still support, it has elections. And I tr believe that when the day comes that President Erdogan in Turkey uh, is voted out of power, 
if there aren't manipulations, uh, I believe fairly surely he will he will step down. So the question of the compatibility of 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 religion of, of, of Islam and democracy that the Muslim Brotherhood in particular, I think, is accepted uh, is far from over and the, and the debate is is far from over. I mean, we're even arguing in, in the United States about religious ideas in social belief, abortion, among other things. Um, so the you cannot you cannot totally separate moral views from policy views, and moral views are found, importantly founded often on on religious ideas. Doesn't have to be, but that tends to be their source. To what extent do you see the um, the NED Open Society regime change uh, crowd? Uh, influence in the Arab Spring, um, and to what extent would you would you think that uh, caused a backlash against it? At one time, when I was still working in Washington, I was a big believer in the National Endowment for Democracy, and I believed that democracy had a lot to offer to much of the world. I still believe democracy, well, I mean, it's like Winston Churchill said, it's the worst form of governance, except for all those that have been tried before it. Um, but somehow over the years, the National Endowment for Democracy or NED um, really became almost a surrogate for the, for the CIA. Um, the US got out of the, largely out of the business of having the CIA overthrow uh, countries uh, and, and this wasn't, by the way, the CIA choosing to overthrow these places. This was by presidential order or Kissinger order or whatever. Um, the National Endowment for Democracy became a much nicer face for regime change, uh, not, not by violence, but certainly through using all kinds of financial and, and ideological and training and other kinds of things to bring about, to bring about change. Um, I believed that democracy was a great goal for the United States, but as I began to watch it over the years, I began to see how much of this was cherry picking, uh, that we, we, democracy was, as I often said, democracy was a punishment to deliver upon our enemies, to overthrow them. It was democracy is never a gift for our allies. You know, we're not we're not deciding that we're going to bestow democracy upon Saudi Arabia uh, or any other number of of of, uh, of uh, authoritarian regimes around the world. Um, we have all kinds of things to say about uh, Uyghur. Uh, the rights of Uyghurs in China, and I care very deeply about the Uyghurs in China. I've been there. I've written about it. But I think the fact that they're in China seems to be the more important point for the U.S. policy than it is what the state of the Uyghurs um, is um, at this particular. So it's it's highly selective, which undermines the the the, the, legi the credibility, the ideological credibility of the United States in pushing for democracy. We'll do it when we want to overthrow somebody, but we don't have much to say about it otherwise. We don't have much, to say, even in human rights. I mean, this tends to be a weapon used to overthrow or make seriously weaken countries. But if it's, if it's a friendly country, we don't do it. We never talk about the Kashmiris and Indian policy against Kashmir or Indian policies against Muslims in general or other religious groups in India, because India is on there, the good guys, so we don't talk about it. But uh, if it's Palestinians' rights being you know, crushed in Israel, we don't talk about it. But if it's, in, if it's, we, if it's Chechens in Russia or other groups in China, then we're all over it. So I, I, I just feel we, we ideologically um, corrode the very validity of, of, of pushing for a democracy. 
I certainly agree with you on that. The let me take you up on the on the uh, uh, Uyghur Xinjiang issue. I I uh, I read the study you and Frederick Starr did in two thousand and four called the and, Xinjiang uh, problem, which uh, involved mainly, scholars. It yeah, was mainly it was mainly Jonathan Lipman, who is an outstanding scholar of Muslims in China, who was my partner in writing that essay. Fred Starr very capably brought the book all together, many different disciplines, but it was uh -huh. myself and Jonathan Lipman, who is, who's, who has a wonderful book about Muslims in, in China. Very readable, delightful book. Uh, I'll look that up. Since, since that time, of course, you had the, uh, uh, the uh, ISIS-linked Uyghurs who carried out terrorist attacks in Xinjiang. And uh, the Chinese response to that uh, was to launch um, what they call a mass education or mass re-education campaign for the young people being influenced by the jihadis. Uh, and, but at the same time, doing massive economic development in the region, they created new industrial and agricultural projects across Xinjiang. Uh, and certainly that is quite the opposite of the so-called anti-terrorist campaigns in the West, which were largely bombing countries back to the Stone Age. Um, so uh, nonetheless, what China's doing is now, since Pompeo and his ilk uh, is labeled genocide. And in fact, they're imposing sanctions on China because of, and even the, the so-called diplomatic boycott of the, uh, of the Olympics is because of genocide in Xinjiang. Uh, I, I find this to be uh, not only absurd, but really disgusting. But um, you certainly know a great deal about, about the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Do you, how do you look at that now in, in light of this, uh, this, this crisis? Yeah, it's it's a complicated issue, Mike. Um, I, for starters, I would not accept the term genocide, which I think is being extremely loosely applied uh, by Washington. Again, um, not so much on the facts of the issue, uh, because if you looked at Palestinian treatment, its numbers are vastly less. But treatment of Palestinians in in uh, in uh, the West Bank and and Israel. Uh, there might be very comparable things. But anyway, this is not genocide. But I think it is, some people have used the term cultural oppression. Some have even called it culturicide. Um, China has known, is known to be, and I'm a huge admirer of China. I've studied Chinese and, you know, history and literature and things. I have great admiration for China's past and indeed even present extraordinary accomplishments. But China is also a tough country in which to be a minority. Um, the Han Chinese massively dominate just domestic, uh, just numerically the country overwhelmingly um, so that it's difficult to be a minority in China anywhere and not get Hanized, if you will, turned into Han Chinese and linguistically, culturally, and, and otherwise. Uh, this is not unique to China. Other countries have pushed for cultural integration uh, in the past. Uh, I don't know the years exactly, but I think in the 18th century, France had an extraordinary policy of imposing, uh, with some force, imposing the language of Paris on the entire country and wiping out regional dialects and languages such as Celtic languages or uh, uh, Basque and other such. So in the, in the process of nation building, whether you like it or not, governments, whether good or bad or harsh or not, tend to try to push towards homogenization of their, pop, of their population to make it easier to rule, to maybe make it easier for people to get along socially, I don't know. So the Chinese are part of this long tradition. And it's easy when you got 1.4 million people, and I don't know what the statistics are of non-Han minorities, but they're, they're probably pretty small in comparison. So yes, I, I do feel that the Chinese have been rather harsh in Xinjiang in, in the effort to Hanize 
or turn into Chinese, turn into good Chinese, uh, Han Chinese, the, the, the Uyghur population. Uh, and that's, and the Uyghurs, of course, are the furthest away from Beijing of any, any group in the country, way off to the, to the West. I mean, the, the capital of Xinjiang province in China is closer to Islamabad than it is to Beijing. So you're talking about a very distant, culturally long time Turkic Islamic Muslim society. Um, I, I deplore the re-education camps that smacks a bit too much of, to me of, of, of kind of more fascist uh, organizations in the past. But I think, I, I think, I, I, I do not believe that calling this genocide is a legitimate term. And we also have to come to the, to the deeper question of who is it that, that deserves an independent state? Uh, the Chechens uh, in Russia and the Soviet Union have been dis totally distinct ethnic group. They're Muslims, not Christians, but they have been pushing, including using violence for years, to, 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 for over a hundred years to gain independence from the Soviet Union or from Russia. So this is an ongoing problem. Uh, and I certainly don't support violence on either side of this, but I do acknowledge that in any process of industrializing China, including its distant Western regions, factories are gonna be built and mo even more to the point, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Han Chinese have come into areas that have long been occupied, long inhabited by Muslim Uyghur people, Turkic Muslim Uyghur peoples. And they naturally are, are deeply disturbed at, at this huge influx of industrial Chinese workers who are you know, changing the real estate, they're tearing down their old towns, they're, they're weakening Islam, cr closing mosques, Im you know, imposing Chinese language uh, requirements. Obviously, if you're gonna live in China, you damn well better learn Mandarin. Uh, so you can't say that it's all brutal, but it's a complex issue of how do you, how do you try to integrate this country without using brutal techniques? And I think China in recent years has, has moved in the direction of unnecessary harshness in that, in that issue. Well, let me say that they've built more mosques in Xinjiang than any area in the world. Um, so you have to take that into consideration too. What, you, what you're saying about Xinjiang is also true of Tibet. Uh, and yes. uh, our organization from the beginning, LaRouche's ideas and the idea of the Schiller Institute was always predicated on the idea of peace through development, that you can't try to bring about development and then, uh, or you can't, try to bring about peace and then development. You have to actually bring development as a, a way of addressing the common needs of all people, all religious movements, all ethnic differences and so forth. And certainly that's the way the Chinese have approached both Tibet and, uh, and Xinjiang. And in the process have dramatically increased the populations, the Xinjiang, pop, the Uyghur population increased their standard of living enormously. And their argument, of course, is that when people complain about human rights, that the most fundamental human right is the right to life and to a decent standard of living. And they're very proud of having brought the entire country, including all the people of Xinjiang, out of uh, abject, abject poverty. There's still poverty, but it's, uh, it's been eliminated. Uh, and a lot of this is, uh, is also what uh, they launched to take internationally their, the process of, of development uh, through the Belt and Road. And of course, Xinjiang is a crossroad for the Belt and Road. So I'm, let, let me ask you to, to say what you think about the whole Belt and Road process, which of course is also roundly denounced by the anti-China people in the West with all kinds of, uh, of, of nasty terms. Uh, but um, it is a basis on which, if you believe in the idea that peace comes through development, that you can 
resolve these issues, not only in China, but in, uh, in Afghanistan and in the Middle East. And in particular, I wonder what you think about the efforts by China to bring the Belt and Road into, uh, into the Middle East. I think the Chinese idea of the Belt and Road is an extremely imaginative and exciting idea. Um, it is visionary in the sense of uniting and bringing together diverse societies across Central Asia that have been not, not been united since the days of Chinggis Khan, who was a brutal conqueror, but for a hundred years thereafter, proceeded to run a pretty enlightened and uh, peaceful um, administration uh, across all across Central Asia uh, as, as a Chinese dynasty, later as a Chinese dynasty. So I think it's inspired. Central Asia has been the backwater of the world for a long, long time, even though it was in, in medieval periods, it was a rich center of, uh, of commerce and trade and, and uh, ideas and uh, science, et cetera, along the lines of Ibn Sina, who lived in that area himself. This includes Iran, of course. So I, I think it's a, a, an extraordinary idea that the Chinese have been developing here in context with Russia um, as well. It's, going to, it's a complicated area. Uh, there are many ethnic uh, sensitivities in the area. Muslims traditionally do not like to feel that they are under the thumb, however you choose to interpret it, under the dominance, under the overwhelming power of non-Muslim uh, power. And they would view China in that regard. They would view Russia in that regard, but it doesn't mean that they will reject it. It just means there are going to be certain sensitivities about Islamic culture, Islamic history and tradition that um, that will play important role, I think, in the future of that Belt and Road. And China will need to, and Russia, of course, will need to move very cautiously with full regard for the cultural and religious traditions um, of that area. But I think, yes, it can do a great deal for the welfare, the livelihood, standard of living, uh, cultural development and everything else to have this area opened up from an area that will go from, well, you know, I can say Beijing, but in many senses, even from, from uh, Korea, all the way across land and sea to now Italy, I think, which is the westernmost uh, point of, at, this, at this stage of, of the Belt and Road concept. It's, it's very, it's very positive. It's very highly constructive imaginative idea. Have you looked into the efforts between China and let's say Iraq, for instance, to bring in some of these Belt and Road projects? The last government had agreements of uh, oil for development, which got I'm crushed, not, unfortunately. I, but. Yeah, I'm not terribly familiar with where Iraq stands on the Belt and Road. I mean, inevitably, it will be part, it's, it would be a natural part. I mean, that was part of this road going way back when it ran from, you know, Beijing to Beirut, in effect, uh, back in the day. I don't know where it stands now with Iraq, but certainly Iran. In Iran, it is uh, already China is playing a very significant role in helping relieve some of the, the, the more uh, op oppressive aspects of American sanctions. And Iran has been historically a, a, major, a major country, a major culture that was part of that whole, that whole uh, Belt and Road civilization. It was a, it was a Muslim Arab Persian society, uh, Turkic a, a, as well. Very important. All those three cultural groups. Um, China, China does not always have the best reputation going way back as fully honoring societies that resist uh, homogenization. And Muslim societies tend to resist a bit homogenization into non-Muslim cultures for whatever. You could have a long discussion about why. 
Uh, so and I, I, I think the idea is brilliant, but Ch as I said before, China and Russia need to step cautiously and uh, sensitively with this huge new cultural region that will benefit that region, I believe, hugely. Good. I'd like to ask two other things on Afghanistan before we leave that. One, one is that I read an article you wrote recently called Time to Smash the Urge of Imperial Strategic Group Think. That wasn't uh, my title. Oh, it wasn't? OK. Yeah, it's it will, quite a it title. Will do. It will do. <laughs> Anyway, it, it, what I noted in there was that you said that the entire Afghan misadventure was less about fighting terrorism and more about establishing a base uh, near the Russian and Chinese borders, sort of as part of the great game. Um, there are indications that the pullout of Afghanistan was less about ending uh, regime change wars and more about repositioning for confrontations with China and Russia. And you may have heard that Tony Blinken just yesterday basically acknowledged that. He said, uh, I wrote it down, it's in ending America's longest war and making sure that we're not sending a third generation of Americans back to fight and die in Afghanistan. That frees up a tremendous amount of resources uh, and focus for other challenges. And the reporter even said, do you think the American people has an appetite for other challenges? And he said, oh, I think the appetite is significant. But um, anyway, I, I wonder what you think about, uh, about this in terms of the going forward. I think it was fairly clear back in 9-11, in, in uh, 2001, that the invasion of Afghanistan was about far more than bin Laden. Bin Laden certainly was the perfect poster boy enemy uh, for that invasion. And it was an outrageous, 9-11 uh, was an outrage, an outrage against the United States and, and generally uh, uh, through the use of, of terrorism and, and murder. But um, yes, I think there was, it was not by accident that the US was well aware that Afghanistan sits athwart China, Russia, Central Asia. Um, they understood that you know, all you have to do is read about the British great game back in the day, 8th, 19th century, um, and America fighting and uh, supporting the Afghans against um, the Soviet invasion in, uh, in 1978. So the idea of the, the geopolitical significance of Afghanistan is well, well known. We just didn't talk about it very much because it was a much better sale, a much better sell to talk about terrorism and, and Afghanistan. I, I'm not sure that the US is quite ready to throw in, uh, give up its spurs in Afghanistan for the very same reason that it borders on Russia, borders on China, and might in the US eyes be a, a check possibly to elements of the Belt and Road. Uh, if the US has a better idea than the Belt and Road or can, can, could contribute to it or work simultaneously with it, that would be great. But I think uh, now, anyway, it seems to be a zero sum game in American eyes, and it doesn't want to participate in any, in any way that would facilitate uh, this, this Chinese venture. But yeah, I don't think we've really let go quite there. And it, it won't be until we start generously helping rebuild that country that we helped to destroy um that we then that that we become credible in our uh willingness to look for better days for the afghan people and get and get out of the region so i want to uh ask as i think a last question um the issue of the cultural decay in the united states uh and in the western world generally i read uh some reviews of your memoir i didn't read the memoir but the book you wrote about the death of your son to drug addiction. Um, and as you probably know, it was just recently announced that there have been 100,000 overdose drug deaths this last year. That's by far uh, the highest uh, ever. Um, and the economic and cultural decay in the country has really left the whole generation of children who have no sense of a positive future. They don't have a sense of a mission in the world. 
Uh, and this, of course, has resulted in some horrible atrocities like the child killers. We had one just the other day in Michigan. Uh, and a record high teen suicides. Um, well, since you did have that experience, what do you, how do you read this yourself in terms of what we're going to have to do to revive the uh, culture in the United States? Well, drugs in many ways are the bane of the modern world everywhere in some sense. In the United States, uh, as you know, we've had not had a great deal of luck, even with the banning of all kinds of drugs uh, over the years, have not had great success with it. And the so-called war against drugs uh, that's been going on, what, 20, 30 years as part of many administrations, uh, punishing various Latin American countries for helping produce this stuff in which we are the main uh, market. Um, this, this goes back a, a, a long way and with all the problems that, that you talk about, I, yes, it's been, it's really sad. It's been exacerbated by COVID. Um, it's, it's gotta be exacerbated by just ex existential angst from global warming, uh, the future of the world. I, what I now feel is an, an excessive sense of individualism within the United States culture. Individualism has been a wonderful feature of American culture. It produced amazing artistic accomplishments and scientific and technical accomplishments, all kinds of things. But it does have a downside, this extreme, extreme individualism of the United States, which means that there's not so coherent a society as you might find in, in say slightly more traditional European cultures, but even they are suffering from drugs. So I'm not sure what the answer to all of this is, but certainly the conditions of American life, um, the discrepancy between rich and poor um, and the negativism that emerges from this uh, that you can see in the music and the arts and other things certainly is exacerbating it hugely. But it's in some senses, it's a global problem. It's a human problem. Let me close by asking if you have anything else you'd like to say, like to, say to, uh, to our audience. No, just my, to express my concern about where the US is headed now, the viability of American democratic practice at this point. Um, I think the future of the world is going to be ever more demanding obviously for starters because of social of, because of global warming and um, and and pandemics also the negative impacts of technology apart from the many wonderful aspects of technology there are many many socially negative impacts of technology my fear is that countries are going to find themselves increasingly unmanageable in which the power of the state is going to be perceived as more and more necessary just in COVID alone to try to control the spread of COVID and manage the treatment of COVID has required a great empowerment of the state, not just in the US, but globally. So uh, I think in a country that's as intensely individualistic as the United States is, where people can say, well, you know, I want to do what I want to do, and it's my freedom, uh, it's my body, whatever. There are all kinds of very good reasons for pushing back against this. But I think in the modern world, in a modern world of delicate technology and countries existing on delicate balances of, of how technologies interact, you, 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 you're gonna, you, you can't have, you can't really uh, survive in a country that is verging on the anarchistic in many regards, that cannot provide good government and good governance. So I, I fear very much for where the future of the US is headed right now. It may not just be the United States, it may be the West, and the West may be ahead of much of the rest of the world, but the problem of control of populations getting ever bigger and the crises, global warming, disease, technology, et cetera, et cetera, 
I fear are going to hugely empower our states. And China is basically arguing that they are the vanguard uh, of the future in this regard. I think the thing that I find most still deeply depressing about the United States is its still addiction to uh, never ending war. Uh, we talked about that briefly before, but I think I am appalled that even with very progressive thinkers like Bernie Sanders, even Bernie Sanders has not dared to grasp the nettle of the Pentagon budget and the ongoing wars or only very slightly. It's still, you know, we can't afford medical, medical care. We can't afford, you know, infrastructure. We can't afford COVID or one thing or another, but boy, we can afford those them wars. Uh, and I, I'm appalled that even today, nobody, just about nobody is suggesting that maybe, uh, you know, one third of the Pentagon budget might go a long way to beginning to solve a few of these domestic problems. It's beyond the pale, that discussion right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Either party. Either yeah, party. Yeah, right. Okay, well, thank you very much. This will be most interesting.